all of the signals from Europe that Europe is sending is like, well, we would be happy having a war with you, all out war. And that's why I'm extremely worried. And you asked about nuclear, the nuclear question. Like in the mainstream media, we read, don't worry about nuclear weapons. Don't worry. The Russians are bluffing. This is utterly dumb. It is really, really dumb to play, play with fire, to play with nuclear fire and not take this risk serious. Hello everybody, this is Pascal from Neutrality Studies and today I would like to share with you an interview that a Argentinian colleague in Germany did with me the other day. Uh, it was done by Ezequiel Bistoletti. He has his own channel called uh, Demolishing um, Myths of Politics. It's in Spanish and this, the video will go online in Spanish translation um, <clears throat> over on his channel. Here is the English original. It's mainly me talking, uh, but I hope you still enjoy that, my analysis of the situation situation. Here we go. Good evening, good afternoon, and uh, good morning. Welcome to Demolishing Political Myths. Welcome to our talk number 101. Today we have the pleasure of having with us Professor Pascal Lotas, who is an associate professor at the Kyoto University, and he also produces an amazing YouTube channel called Neutrality Status. We recommend and ask you all to follow his work. He's also generous enough to allow ourselves to republish some of his great contents. Pascal, how are you there in Japan? I'm very fine. Thank you, Ezequiel, and thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure to have you to have you here and let me um, add to your description that your YouTube channel, which is in English, Neutrality Studies, has a um, Spanish version where you, I think, publish everything that you do in Spanish, and it's called Sanevox Español. We will link everything below in the description, but go there because it's really worthy. Pascal, I wanted to start from the more general things and then go more into detail. Um, the first question that I wanted to discuss with you is how close are we to um, an open war in Europe and how fast do you think that eventual open war could escalate into a nuclear war? So first of all, we already have an open war in Europe. Um, it's between Ukraine and Russia and um, it's also between NATO and Russia inside Ukraine. Uh, and this war has been very bloody, has been very horrible. We don't have exact casualty numbers, but by now it is absolutely certain that it is in the hundreds of thousands. So we are probably, we are probably close to half a million dead soldiers from the Ukrainian side and the Russian side combined. We have several tens of thousands of dead civilians. Um, and often the Europeans say this is the first time war has returned since the Second World War to Europe. And all of these people utterly forget that we also had uh, wars in the Balkans and very, very bloody wars uh, in, the, in the 90s over there. Horrible. We had, we had Chechnya and so on. Um, but we have this new war on European soil. And this war could escalate into a what I call the, the fifth general European war in 400 years. Is often people could say like, oh, the Third World War, but it's like, you know, it's, this, is not, this is not the full story. We had the Thirty Years' War that ended in 1648. We had the Napoleonic Wars, and both of these wars were absolutely on the scale of a world war inside of Europe, right? Um, the difference between these two wars and the First and Second World War is that back then, the, the colonial powers didn't expand yet far enough in order to export the war to the entire world. But they were basically, they were that. They were general wars in Europe where almost every nation was involved. And then the First and Second World War. And now we are at the doorsteps of the fifth such war. Um, 
For the world, if they are lucky, then others can stay out of it and it remains a general European war. And if we are not, then it might might expand to to large parts of Asia, uh, North, North America. Although the way things are going right now, I do think that South America, Africa and and good parts of Asia are way more insulated. And even if the Europeans go to all-out war, um, uh, there's good chances that others would not. So, it, But it might may be a fifth general European war. And we are close to that. According to uh, the, the, the president of Serbia, Mr. Vucic, uh, that is only about three months away. And I hope he's wrong. I really hope he's wrong. In that, in that interview that he did with my countryman, uh, Roger Köppel, uh, and, and um, a publisher who I once had the chance to interview on my channel as well. I mean, the, the, they do they do really good reporting, and and there he said, like Vucic said, about three months, and the Hungarians are very very worried, right? Viktor Orban keeps saying like, if you send NATO troops, then I'm not going to send any, and you wouldn't say that unless you were actually worried that this is on the cards. This is not just making um, getting more political support inside the country. The, the Hungarians, the Serbs, they're seriously worried. And the rest of Europe, for some reason, which I think is some, some kind of mental damage, um, they are rather excited about this. There's a lot of people who say, like, we shouldn't be worried about nuclear war. We shouldn't be worried about war in general. We just have to teach Russia a lesson and we have to break up Russia. The Europeans just made Kayakalis their new... Um, high representative of um, foreign affairs, like, I mean, the, the EU foreign minister, right? High representative for, for external Borrell. affairs. Exter mm -hmm. No, he, Borrell is out. Kaya ah, Kala the new one, you mean. The, the, the Kaya Kalas yeah. is a new one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, she came in two days ago or one day ago. Borrell is now, is now the former one. And Kaya Kalis, the former prime minister of Estonia, is now uh, uh, the EU foreign policy chief. And she's the one who suggested to break up Russia. I mean, uh, a month or like six weeks ago, she said that. And that's now the head diplomat of the Europeans. And uh, Ursula von der Leyen was reappointed. So all of the signals from Europe that Europe is sending is like, well, we would be happy having a war with you, all out war. And that's why I'm extremely worried. And you asked about nu the nuclear question. Like in the mainstream media, we read, don't worry about nuclear weapons. Don't worry. The Russians are bluffing. This is utterly dumb. It is really, really dumb to play, play with fire, to play with nuclear fire and not take this risk serious. And the Russians are actually internally, I mean, they publish all of these papers and they have this discourse. You can follow all of them. Uh, Karaganov, one of the head... Uh, intellectuals is saying like we need to make it clear to the Europeans that they have to be afraid of us. We need to ins install fear into them again because they seem not to take it serious. And it's like okay, um, this <laughs> I am at the at the end of my wits because I uh, also in, in in discussions with with people on an everyday on an everyday basis it seems that nobody is worried. Everybody seems to think because we survived the Cold War by sheer luck without a nuclear fallout, oh, everything's going to happen again. I mean, uh, this is going to be fine again. So and Putin is just an, uh, a, a bastard like Hussein and needs to be put in his place and probably hung from the neck like Hussein. And it's like, okay, if that is an utter, utter dumb position to take, and I'm very worried that this kind of stupidity will land us in the fifth general war in 400 years. Yeah. Yeah, as, as you were saying... Um that um, I was remembering the, I think, three or four attacks that were carried out against this uh, early recognition radar system thousands of kilometers away from the uh, conflict zone, from, from, from the point of call, the line of contact within Russia, um, attacking this uh, radar systems that actually, according to the nuclear doctrine of, the, of Russia, would be a reason enough to start a nuclear war, right? Without any connection to uh, the hostilities uh, in the line of uh, contact. Now, so um, I couldn't agree more with that. Um, let me uh, ask you a question related to this, Pascal. Um, in the case of um, 
let, let, let us call us um, a direct war, you make a very good distinction within open world and, and, and at a possible escalation. You're completely right about that. But in the case of an escalation and Europe participating directly in a direct war with troops there, how probable do you think it would be that the US would uh, support uh, Europe against Russia? Or do you think that the US would say, okay, guys, uh, this has paid up. We go out of here. Now we um, uh, focus on China, which is our real adversary. And we leave you there with this war against Russia. How do you see the, the eventual role of the US in that war? Um, the United States, just like with Israel, would not be able to take itself out of the European theater just because they're too deeply inside already. And I don't mean politically, I mean operationally. You have this huge US military base in uh, Germany, in Rammstein. You have US troops in Estonia, in, in, in um, Latvia, in, um, uh, in Poland, in Romania. And these, these troops also act as tripwires. That means that when the Russians, if, if this whole um, conflict escalates and the Russians believe that they have no other choice but to, um, but to take out these military installations, many U US uh, military personnel will die um, in the hundreds, if not in the thousands. And once that happens, there will be no way back out of Europe for the European, uh, for the Americans. The public mood in the U.S. is going to be one of, you know, um, absolute indignation, and uh, and and they will want revenge. You know, the one thing that the that the Americans are very sensitive about is American lives. Um, the Americans basically set the Middle East and Central Asia ablaze because three thousand of their citizens died on 9/11. Um, most countries around the earth have the experience of um, having had killed three, four, five, ten thousand pe people of theirs by the Americans in South America, <laughs> in the Middle East, and there's nothing they can do. The Americans, whenever somebody of theirs dies, then it's all out war. Um, and that's, that um, is something that is dangerous to everybody because it would mean that um, the Americans would be in it for in it to win it, um, which me, but but in Europe, so Europe would be the battlefield, and you can see right now what happened to the current battlefield, which is Ukraine. Ukraine is devastated. Ukraine is dead. Um, I mean, a third of its population is now outside of Ukraine. The, it's it's nowhere near its um, industrial and, and economic capacity where it was before, and that on a massive scale would happen to many countries in Europe, I mean, to the European continent. And if the whole thing goes nuclear, then it would go nuclear on the European continent. Before Moscow and Washington shoot missiles at each other, they would, they would you know, get rid of uh, everybody you can get rid of without triggering that. So Warsaw, um, uh, 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 I mean, the Romanians, uh, pro maybe even Berlin, I'm not sure, although they are, of course, under the nuclear umbrella of, of the US, but everybody else might be in in huge danger uh it's 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 a catastrophic situation and the americans wouldn't be able to take themselves out and you saw how keen they were to de-escalate the situation in the middle east when when israel blew up that consulate in syria that iranian consulate which was you know a, a horrific act and which was was supposed to drag the us into a war with iran and they managed to de-escalate that together with Iran because it is unthinkable that the U.S. can take itself out of a war between um, Iran and, and Israel. And in the same sense, if U.S. personnel dies in Europe, uh, they, will, they will be in it. And this is, this is something that I, I can't predict how it, would, how it would evolve. But I don't see the Americans just to lose like hundreds or thousands of troops in Europe and say like, OK, we learned our lesson. We're out of here. That, mm -hmm. that, that wouldn't be their reaction. And I think the, the Russians also know that, which is one of the reasons why they're actually restraining themselves from going that, that far. They are now still in the phase where you, you fight this proxy war 
as tough as you can in the proxy space. But the problem we are facing is that uh, it's the it's the Americans and the Europeans that are that are signaling that they're willing to go beyond that space by giving the okay to the Ukrainians to use these weapons against Russia proper. Uh, and when I say like these weapons, I mean like that the Europe that the Brits and the Americans are both helping with programming these missiles, the Attackums and and the Storm Shadow missiles to hit targets into Russia proper. And the Russians have made it very clear, anything uh, inside basically the former borders of Ukraine, including Crimea, to them, they, they, it's fair game. You can attack it and they wouldn't take it as an, as an escalation beyond. But if you start um, shooting at targets in Belgorod, which the Ukrainians have, if you, if you start shooting at targets inside Russia proper, more like this, this um, defend this um, nuclear uh, uh, um, reconnaissance uh, uh, system that you talked about. Then that is a clear escalation, and the Europeans and Americans have been have shown that they're willing to do that. Which is why I'm absolutely um, I'm desperate. I want them to stop that. This is this is playing with fire, horrible fire. Yeah. Yeah, and um, regarding um, uh, the participation of Western personnel in these attacks, well, I remember that even Scholz admitted that publicly when he said that uh, French and British um, military personnel were programming the uh, long-range missiles that uh, were shot uh, from Ukraine, no? those uh, Storm Shadow missiles and Scalp B missiles as well. So it's not something that we, you or we are speculating about. It's something that is publicly accepted. But um, let me ask you then, um, how do you think that this situation uh, could change in the case of uh, Donald Trump being uh, elected? Today, we will have the first uh, presidential debate. That will be fun to watch, <laughs> for sure. Um, do you think that something would change in this regard, in this common, in this general situation that you were describing? I mean, that's the only hope I have. Uh, let me put it this way. If Joe Biden wins, then we know that nothing will change, right? That's the only thing we can be sure. Um, this guy is going to continue doing the stuff the way he's been doing it so far. And it's going to be the same policy team. I mean, it's, uh, I don't, know how many decisions uh, Mr. Biden is still able to take them himself, but we know that Jake Sullivan is there. We know that that uh, the, the, the Blinken is there, and I don't think these people would go away in a second term. So the machine would remain the same, and I don't see that machine changing course. Maybe they would because they want to fight with China, but I wouldn't bet on that. I mean, their entire reputation still hinges on what... Uh, Alex Kristoforou from the Duran usually calls Project Ukraine. <laughs> Project Ukraine is dear to these people and they will try to see it through, right? In one, one way or another. Um, so that's the only thing that we can be sure about. Now, what Trump actually will do, of course, we don't know. Um, he said he would find a way to end the war on day one. Um, and he, he le recently said that uh, NATO is part of the problem, and NATO expansion provoked Russia, which is a huge shift, right? And Ni Nigel Farage said the same. And this is this is a shift in like what the top top notch politicians who are very close, even not in power, but very close to power, are saying. So if he gets back into office, I think we have chances that they that he might actually figure a way out and actually start talking to the Russians and say like, okay, fine, you want a deal? Let's do a deal. And Mr. Trump would be kind of from the way that he has been portraying himself and, and what he has done in his first term. He is the closest to that. I mean, again, he's the only US president who ever managed to meet the, the leader of North Korea twice. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that, even though it went with a rather fiery rhetoric, and it didn't really produce the escalation. I mean, that in and of itself was was a breakthrough. So uh, he at least has a track record with doing these kind of things. And although I'm 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 not a I'm not a Trump fan, and I was thoroughly opposed to him back in 2016. By now, I personally hope he will be elected because I think with with Biden, there's just no chance of getting out of this. And with him, we might have. Although last time he became president. 
he elected, he selected exactly the wrong people for his foreign policy. He brought in uh, Pompeo as his uh, as his um, uh, um, secretary of state. He brought in that walrus guy. Um, what's his name? Um, uh, Bolton. Um, Bolton. That is a despicable human being, you know, just on on every level, like in terms of how he's willing to kill. Like he, this guy would is willing to kill millions in order to get his vision of foreign policy. Um, he didn't demote any anyone from the permanent state, and Victoria Newland was still there, and and the neocons were all there. So all of these swamp creatures, they were they they remained or were even elevated, but that was last time. Maybe I would have a little bit of hope that by now he understands that dynamic better and that he might not reappoint them. But there's really no, there's nothing, there's nothing that would give me, give me certainty in this. Also, if you look at his donors and so on, when it comes to Israel, for instance, it's utterly clear that he's still within the swamp. I mean, he either chose not to pick that fight and go along. <laughs> Or, or he actually thinks that um, getting these millions of dollars from these um, from these donors, APAC connected donors, and and going with the pro Israel rhetoric is actually important. With it, whichever way it is, it's just a sign that also he is not outside of the um, of the of this policy establishment. Um, so to cut it short, I hope that he wins because he's the only one I think who could potentially end or help to end. The war in Europe, but that's not a given at all. I'm just, I just think Joe Biden would definitely not do that. Uh huh. Um, I, I, I agree with you in general terms, and uh, I think just like you, I struggle with myself to um, uh, believe that he is the. the best option but i should rephrase the lesser evil <laughs> um with regards to to the u.s presidency as i am a, a left-leaning person uh, i do not like a lot of things that he say he says but i do believe that uh, with this regard he is the lesser evil so uh, i i have exactly the same view Uh, in this regard, but there is one thing that um, I also notice, and that is that in the case that he deactivates the conflict in Ukraine, which would be amazing, and uh, at least deactivating the the sticking bomb, really, uh, that could um, be followed by um, a further escalation in the um, China conflict through Taiwan and, well, through um, um, Philippines and Vietnam and so on. In fact, he was the one who uh, somehow started to redirect U.S. foreign policy. There were some measures by Obama, but mostly Obama was still in the war on terror uh, until uh, Trump came and he said, okay, Let's put sanctions on China. Let's focus on China, as China is our main, uh, or our main. Um, they don't call it enemy so still, but um, uh, opponent or challenge in the uh, struggle for world hegemony. So, don't you think that we could be somehow putting out a fire and at the same time starting a new one with uh, Trump? How do you see that? Um, yes, that that is a possibility because the only thing I think that the Democrats and Republicans uh, in in the U.S., uh, especially in Congress, agree on is that they want to go to war with China. That have picked that as their as as, as a strategic goal. Like the, that's what comes from the think tank. That's what comes from the rhetoric. Um, I and even if they if they say all of that in the intention of not not making it happen like in the in the in the idea of having deterrence which I don't think they do that's not what I, what I think but that's what they say they say like we need to deter china right but even if that was true 
it w could still be a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that you do everything that that then in the end leads to the to the very circumstance that even some well-meaning deterrence people might have wanted to just not happen but you 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 provoke it because of i mean in international relations it's it's really simple this um security dilemma is well known is well studied and the more you put into your own security the more you the more you buy wep the more weapons you produce and the more uh, ships you put right next to china the more china will feel feel threatened and the more it will actually improve its own military capabilities and the more you will say like look these these bastards are like uh, upgrading their military uh, equipment we need to upgrade ours they're you know it's like this this escalation it's a security dilemma and and at least that one will kick in now i don't think that they are truthful i think that they actually want that war because they want to break china they want you know the way that they want to break up russia the uh, with this idea that to russia you should have um uh, to Ru russia should go down the route of yugoslavia should break up again and then we should do the same to china and break up china because china is also a role model for basically a multi-ethnic state right you could break up china beautifully and have tibet and have hong kong and have xinjiang and have uh, have the the uh, Manchurian part, and you could have a a tiny little hard China, and you could have Shanghai could go independent with with surrounding areas. I mean, you could do all of that, and I'm pretty sure this is on the minds of these neocons because they once it happened to one of their strategic opponents, and they've been dreaming of re replicating this ever since. Um, so, and if I was sitting in China and if I knew my Chinese history that, you know, China itself goes through through periods of being united and being disunited, I would actually worry about that. <laughs> so um, the I do think that these American strategists and also the Republicans would try to redirect their efforts toward China, although although the Trump movement, the MAGA movement, has been the closest thing to a restraining effort inside the US that we have seen in the last 80 years. The, um, the American first ideology with, with let's focus on our country, the last time we saw that was in the 1930s and 40s. And those these people today are called this... Um, uh, um, like, uh, isolationists. In, uh, isolationists, in yeah. They, mm -hmm. and, and pejoratively, right? Pejoratively, they're called these people are isolationists. Me, with the studies I do, I, I constantly remind people that, no, at the time, nobody thought of themselves as isolationists. They thought of themselves as neutralist. They were they are neutral. They will not intervene in foreign wars, and they will not, in the words of Quincy Adams, uh, search for monsters. They will not look for monsters abroad to fight. They will just concentrate on themselves. And, and the Donald Trump's movement, at least the people on the ground who, who sign up for it, are, at least a part of them, are close to that way of thinking so if there is a chance of the united states ever becoming again more self-restraining and more more focused toward ameliorating its own country and hemisphere even just the hemisphere you know even these people wouldn't say uh south america is none of our concern even these people would would think that you know latin america uh is is our backyard but that would already be an improvement away from let's be the world hegemon and let's let's tell people in central asia how to live their lives and let's break up china and russia and and rule the world that would already be a step toward uh, a more less bellicose uh, 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 way of running international relations and uh, again i I am. I really am not a fan of Donald Trump, but he is the closest one to actually go there from all the options we have, um, the realistic ones, because by now we know that there was some hope with um, Mr. Kennedy, but that one is gone by now. Um, this third party candidate, this moment when a third party candidate actually takes the presidency, I think is still uh, quite far away in the future. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, they were neutralists with regard to Europe and Asia, right? Uh, with regard to Latin America, it was always concealed as the, their backyard and they follow the Monroe yeah. Doctrine, but uh, but uh, you're completely right about your, your interpretation. Um, we had two weeks ago this uh, so-called peace summit in, in, in your home country in, in Switzerland. 
But at the same time, two weeks ago, I think it was one or two days before the Spiss summit um, started, uh, we had uh, President Putin uh, stating the conditions uh, that Russia somehow requires in order to um, start a ceasefire and start negotiations. Do you think that any of these two um, positions uh, or events could somehow bring us closer to a possible resolution? Or do you think that they are completely a dead end on both sides? No, they're not. They're actually the closest thing to hope I have to get toward a diplomatic solution. Um, both of them are officially <clears throat> rejected by the other one. But both of them were registered. I mean, both of them were big enough to not only attract our attention, but to attract each other's attention. So in a sense, we are now closer to the start of diplomatic uh, negotiations than we were at any time before, because we know the baselines of these, of these camps. And the thing is, the Europeans or the, 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 the collective West actually more or less officially let go of Zelensky's peace formula. I mean, this was the biggest, my biggest fear that we would just end up with uh, the, uh, the, the Swiss peace summit reaffirming Zelensky's formula, which is uh, a, a demand for capitulation, right? For Russian capitulation, which is so far away from anything reasonable that that, that one, that one is an actual dead end what came out of the of the swiss peace summit is actually closer to um some of the terms that china laid out in its in its peace proposal um still still far away from that but it is we got closer you know in a sense and what the russians what vladimir putin laid out is again um his his baseline out of which i mean out of the, the terms he laid out the most Obvious one is, of course, the neutrality of Ukraine, no NATO membership. Um, and he actually said neutrality and uh, non-alignment, uh, both of them together. Okay. And the other thing is then the retreat of the rush of, of Ukraine's troops from these from the current from the uh, territories of the four oblasts, the the administrative territories, uh, Saporizhia. Um, uh, Kherson, the, the and Donetsk and Lugansk, Republic Donetsk and Lugansk, um, that are still fought about. And he said, if they retreat, then we will immediately stop firing. That's if they if they signal we are willing to retreat, we will not fire at anyone who goes back. And um, that is not to say that this is what they should do. This this tells me that okay, even if you don't do that. But you, you signal willingness, for instance, to talk about neutrality, the, the neutrality option, we would have a moment when probably the Russians would, when um, back-channel diplomacy would be possible. As in, um, the Russians said very clearly, we will not stop shooting, we will, we will not do a, some weird kind of truce along the, the line of contact. We have uh, strategic goals, and last time we did that, well, last time we even signaled our willingness back in 2022 in April and withdrew, you immediately filled up and you, you, you called us names and you said, like, you're too weak, so this time we're not going to do any of that. But in order for negotiations to start, even while the fighting still goes on, um, I do think we are closer to that moment than, uh, than before. And also the fact that Vladimir Putin said, uh, even recently, the terms are still the same. This is still valid. Um, gives me hope that we could go down that route if it was chosen, and if the if the Europeans said and the, the the West said, okay, let's actually have negotiations, even if the fighting still continues. Um, I, I I would hope that that that's actually on the cards. Um, it's clear though that the the Swiss peace summit in this sense was um, was obviously was obviously not bringing peace but it might not be entirely useless for the entire process of the you know the back and forth on my own channel i called it a disaster but um in terms of the process that that we are seeing going on it might still end up delivering something that might become part of the solution even though what we have seen is definitely not the solution yet yeah 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 in fact um 
one of the um, final final points of this uh, very very um, washed out resolution that they had. One of them was the um, participation of the other part of the conflict, which amazingly was not taking part in a peace uh, summit. And this was requested in part by some of the um, biggest supporters of Ukraine, such as Germany. So in that regard, um, it could be, even though it was a disaster, as you called it, um, and, and I agree with your with your assessment as well, um, it could be, yeah, it could bring us closer, certainly diplomatically, to a solution. Um, from the Russian side, I am not sure that um, Putin made this proposal uh, expecting it to be accepted, or I think he rather expected the opposite, but it still is a, a step towards a resolution for sure. Um, but um, let us let us change the focus for, for, for a second. You're, you work in, in in Japan, but you are a Swiss, you're a European citizen. We were talking, uh, I think, two weeks ago in your channel about um, Europe and um, yeah, what I think is the reasons the reason why they are doing what they are doing, which is somehow shooting themselves or it's Europe is shooting itself in the foot. How do you see that, uh, Pascal? Why is Europe taking this uh, suicidal uh, way towards a, a war that has no benefits at all for Europe? Well, I mean, I think I need to be clear here. I don't think the Europeans shoot themselves in the foot. They're shooting themselves in both foots and they try to cut them off at the same time. <laughs> this is one of the dumbest policies that, I mean, in the history of dumb policies, of which Europe has a lot, you know, this is a continent of stupid decisions that led them to world war after world war. And, and it's usually petty stuff uh, that leads them in there. Uh, just they keep in mind that the First World War was fought mainly among, among monarchies, of which all of them were related by first or second degree. And even the monarchs were like, yeah, we have to go and do this, like the Germans and the, and the British and, and, and the Russians. I mean, they were cousins for F's sake, and they still, they still chose to do that. Um, so a history of stupid decisions, but this currently, especially the, the relentless nature of, of, of going down a, 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 a route that has already proved not to work, like I'm specifically talking about the sanctions. The European Union two or three week, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, enacted the fourteenth sanction package. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is at a point where it is so utterly ridiculous that if it wasn't for such a dire situation with so many people losing their lives, it would just be utterly funny. Um, and the the Russian economy is booming. The American economy is booming. The European economy is is declining and you know the germans are deindustrializing and the german german investors are trying to leave as much as they can and invest in other places including in the us of course i mean so the us wins a lot i understand like uh, on a on a grand strategic uh, level the us has a lot to win of this and the us is doing very well i mean also you know making sure that the germans and the russians for the next half century will never talk to each other again i mean check uh, make make sure that the Europeans are tethered to you even more than before and have no other op options check uh, flourishing economy check like war war industry check like for the Euro for the Americans this is fantastic for the Europeans uh, on on a national level this makes no sense I mean you are the potential battlefield of a much larger war you are losing economically you even had the Germans had their largest infra, one of their largest infrastructure projects blown up. Um, in the best case scenario, the best case that we know from the West, it was a rogue element of Ukraine, right? The state that you support, and maybe a rogue element, so maybe not under direct control, but closely related to the official government. And that's the best case scenario. It could have been Ukraine, the state, which would make it even worse. It could have been one of your NATO allies, 
which would make it even much, much worse. And the solution for this one is just ignore it. Let's just not talk about it anymore. It will go away. We will all forget about it. And we did forget. I mean, it's not in the media, but that's the level of suicidal intent at the moment um, that, that still seems to be in the minds of some of these, I think it's globalist elites, that, that are so you know tethered to the U.S., that they are willing to do that, or um, ideologically and financially. I, uh, I compare that to the way that Eastern European uh, leaders, elites in the Cold War, were firmly tethered to the Soviet Union, right? Their survival was depended on the political support from the Soviet Union. Therefore, they do everything, they, everything possible in order to maintain that. And the moment that support went away, these states went away. Um, in the same sense, I think a lot of, the, of these elites in, in Western Europe today, if the US, if US support went away, they would, be in, they would lose power very, very quickly. And we've seen that with the EU elections recently, so, uh, which, is like, which was a good thing, which gave us, uh, gave us an insight of, of the fact that you know, a lot of people, a lot of people don't support it. Still too many. Too many people still support the current, the current trajectory, but a lot are also like thoroughly already alienated, and that group is only going to grow. Um, so the other thing is like, we are seeing the cracks now. We see that the Hungarians are not, not there. The, 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 um, Slovaks are not, not, uh, completely agree anymore. We see that Italy, Italy is not, is not really happy with where things are going. Um, uh, although Meloni is, 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 uh, is still overall, um, <laughs> pledges her allegiance. Uh, but there are the, these cracks emerging, and I hope these cracks get bigger because at the moment the national interest of European states seem to take backseat, and we also see that with the the whole rhetoric um, of, uh, of solidarity with the United States and 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 um, holding together. We're going to have the NATO summit um, early next month, early July, in Washington, which will probably give us a lot of new clues again but we see that how the at the moment these forces the ones who want to restrain this this globalist uh, movement toward a global nato are working and on the other hand we do have the ideas of global nato and more integration you know we just need to double down more and there's a lot of europeans who want to do that and i think it is sick because obviously this has led us to the place where we have this war in Europe right now and where we are at the brink of more war. And their solution to the problem is let's just do more of the same. And at some point it will work and it will all be fine. It will all be fine. We just must not be afraid of war, of more war. And um, I think they're idiots and I think they, they, um, they might kill us, <laughs> these idiots. Yeah, yeah. Let's not forget next to the um, destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines. Let's not forget the um, assassination attempt against Fitzo, which yeah. Fitzo himself characterized as brought about by <laughs> NATO as well. And not to mention the uh, discrimination that um, Orban or Hungary's Orban receives all the time. And I do not need to clarify that I politically dislike Orban. I'm, as I said, a left-leaning person. He's a right-wing uh, um politician but nevertheless it's obvious that he's being uh, politically extorted and economically extorted all the time by the west just for rejecting the war that's 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 a, just a fact um <clears throat> pascal um you're you 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 live in japan so i'm sure you have a, a, a very good uh, view of public opinion, the common Japanese citizen uh, on the streets and uh, his or her reactions to uh, this conflict. W what do you see on the streets, the common Japanese person, uh, how, how does he or she perceive this uh, conflict? The, the, how do they perceive the position assumed by Japan in this conflict? Uh, what do you see there? Um, so, although I, I live here and work here, I do not have a TV, so I don't watch TV regularly. I watch TV yeah. when I, when I'm, uh, with friends or, 
or, or outside, uh, partially because um, TV news over here are also kind of um, very annoying, the same way that they are in, in Europe and the US, and partially because Japanese TV is even more ridiculous than ours, <laughs> in, for other reasons, for, you know, the, the manga and the little blah and things and left and right, and it's just, I'm fine. That, that's, a, that's a very Japanese thing, that's fine. Um, overall, I must say that um, most people on the street here and most of my Japanese friends, they are aware of the war um, between Ukraine and Russia, and they uh, they have, in general, similar opinions to what you will find in Europe, but on a much, much lower emotional level. Um, I keep saying things over here just cook on like three or four uh, uh, um, states lower. Like, it doesn't bubble. It's like, okay, most and the framing, overall framing of the media here, what I see in the newspapers and when I watch TV is it's similar to what we see in Europe. But actually, um, I have seen um, programs when I was at my friend's place, uh, you know, pretty long, 30, 45 minutes, uh, trying to explain the genesis of the conflict which is something I don't really see in Europe, you know, when the, the Japanese media do try to make sense of this. And I gave a couple of interviews to newspapers here, the Asahi newspaper, one of them, and the journalist, she tried to understand Switzerland's neutrality, and she took two weeks, two weeks to write a short half-page article and interview dif different people, and they go, they try to go pretty deep, and they do not start with a narrative from the beginning. That's already quite different. What is similar is that they take their leads, their main interpretative framework from the West, so from the New York Times and so on, and then they build upon that. So in general, people over here are um, taught that Russia invaded Ukraine, and that Russia is waging a bloody war of aggression, and uh, Ukraine is defending itself, and Ukraine is the victim and needs to defend itself. That's the that's the general thing. But beyond that, the good thing about the Japanese is that many of them say like, "Oh, the war is horrible." They focus on the fact of war and say like, "The war should end as soon as possible." So, in a sense, they um, they don't go down the route of the blame game. At least many, and they say like, "War in general is the problem." So they are more way more susceptible to arguments of um, if we could just end with negotiations, the war tomorrow, that would be great. And many Japan many of my Japanese friends say, like, yeah, that would be fantastic. And then uh, the question of guilt and so on takes takes the back seat. So that's, that's something that gives me a lot of, uh, that makes me feel positive about it. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's what I can say in general. And, you know, Japan's the, the approach of the government has also been close to that lower intensity of, of, of emotions. So their policy toward the Ukraine war has been more very similar to the Swiss one. So send uh, humanitarian aid, send um, aid that can be used by the Ukrainian military to help, help, like with helmets and so on, but no lethal lethal aid, no weapons. Mm -hmm. um, no ammunition, and uh, they put sanctions on Russia, which the Swiss, the Swiss also did, but they leave it at that. They don't go into the military realm. Um, so if we make years of, of involvement in the war, then the Japanese, together with the Swiss, they would rank quite, quite below in the, in, the, in the overall structure of the collective West, right? Whereas Germany mm -hmm. and France and so on, I mean, they are at the verge of sending, sending troops and they send all of these deadly weapons over there. Um, the Japanese don't do that. And I think it also has to do with, with this different perception on the war, which is more nuanced, I think, than what many people on the street in Europe have because of the relentless, relentless propaganda that we have seen over the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. And in, in this regard, Pascal, how was the how was Putin's visit to North Korea and to Vietnam um, two weeks ago? I think that was how was that seen? Uh, did it receive um, the media attention, the general public attention, or is it something that it's only for experts there? Um, I followed the these developments so closely in the Western media that I didn't even pay attention to Japanese media at all. I, I'm sorry. I, I don't know. 
I, I, I would have to look it up, uh, what, how it was reported. Um, the, I honestly, seriously don't know how the Japanese analyzed it again, because no TV at home and uh, uh, the, the newspapers, I, I don't consult them regularly, I'm sorry. Okay, but nevertheless, I will ask you one last question with regard to Japan, as I think I, I, I'm a lover of many uh, cultural mm, things of Japanese culture, uh, in particular manga and, and anime. I think a lot of people love that, me uh, included. Um, so you're a Swiss person living in Japan, I think for several years already. How is the personal experience for a, a European to live there in a culture that I guess it's quite different from European culture in general terms? I don't. Um, I'm very happy here. Japan is a is a, is one of to me is one of the best countries on earth. Um, it is ridiculously safe. It is ridiculously well developed in all and every single way you could think about. It is extremely, um, like, everything here works. It is extremely clean and society is peaceful. Society is very, takes care of each other. I keep thinking that when I, when I take my bike and I go through Kyoto, how much people take care of each other. Um, you know, that's the, the school, school children like crossing the street and the grandpa who helps, helps out with that and, you know, how you help each other on so many levels. So it is a very, as a society, it's, it's a place that I very, very much appreciate. And it feels like home. I've been living here now for 10 years consecutively, but I came for the first time here like 20 years ago and then been on and off, but now 10 years in a row. It, it feels like home. And um, it, uh, it is, uh, of course, it's a different culture, but it is one, I keep thinking, and I, I already thought that 20 years ago, Japan feels like the mo easternmost part of the West. Um, mm -hmm. You do feel that a lot of things work the way you would expect them to work also, um, also in, in Europe. And, you know, Japan for ever since the 1860s took that decision to basically detach itself from Asia and go west. And, um, and this, you can feel that over here, like things work and, and are, are structured in a way that you would also expect from, from the west. I, um, when I go to Southeast Asia, I feel more estranged. Uh, in the sense that cultural clues work differently. But this probably also has, has just to do with the fact that I've been here for, for a while now. But it doesn't feel that strange. And the Japanese are also, in terms of um, human rights, for instance, or of their perception of democracy, they're very closely aligned with the way that the, uh, that the West thinks about it, although not entirely the same. Um, but all in all, very humanistic and something that I appreciate very much, very pacifist. They are way more pacifist than in, than in Europe. And that's one of the things that also tones them down at the moment, um, despite the fact that they are now having uh, government policies to, to increase spending on military assets and produce their own um, domestic uh, missile systems and so on. So they are not, they, are not, uh, they don't reject um, the military, but they they are very strong about um, pacifism inside the country and also outside, way more, way more than the Europeans. I mean, if you compare the Japanese policies, the Japanese don't take part in all of these um, these semi-offensive peacekeeping missions. They they do not send people uh, abroad. They they actually they actually constrain their relatively strong military that they have. Um, they try to have um, diplomatic. Uh, they try to improve diplomatic relations with China. They had a wonderful trilateral summit with China and, and Korea, um, and they do try to regionally integrate, even though um, all of this um, sanctioning and so on is going on. And I do think that also has something to do with this, um, with this more, more pacifist approach to uh, to to their society and to their external um, relations then 
So um, I appreciate Japan very much. And as an academic, there's a lot of good opportunities over here, uh, which I like because um, a lot of the academic programs are not designed to produce a predetermined outcome. You actually get funding over here for creative, uh, for, for creative ideas. My neutrality studies thing, I, I got hired two times by two different universities for this. Uh, although it is even for also for Japanese uh, standards, it's outlandish, but they appreciate that and uh, creative ideas. So at the moment, um, at the moment, this is a this is a pretty liberal, um, open society. Even if it doesn't look look like that to the outside, um, mm -hmm. I must say though, this depends on where you work in. I mean, if you work for one of the companies, then you are in a very restrictive field. Uh, and you are very, we are very confined, um, uh, also, also culturally. But you, there are spaces that you can find in Japan that I think that in Europe we had once, and they're they're closing down. They're getting more restrictive. Also, freedom of speech over here is still um, is way more open than um, than in Europe. Like, and this whole idea that oh, you have to be careful with what I'm saying, and and and. I do this, can I do that, cancel culture. It doesn't, you don't have it here. And if you do, you have it like in like toned down, much, much toned down version, which is interesting. While to the outside, Japan tries to look like it's just another version of Europe. On the inside, it doesn't work like that. And I find that very actually liberating to myself. Uh -huh. Okay, I, I find surprising that you say that um, Japan is safer and cleaner than Switzerland, which is supposed yes. to be very safe yes. and very clean. But <laughs> it, wow, then it's pristine, I, I would say. Or, or <laughs> I get, I get, you know, over here, yeah. any kind of station you go, you can use the yeah. station toilet, and it probably even has a washlet that kind of cleans down there for you. Yeah, and I itself yeah. is clean. And nobody throws away cigarette butts. I get really annoyed when I go back to Europe and everybody just throws their <laughs> cigarette butts. And the worst ones is the people in Bern Station who they throw the cigarette butts on the tracks. That's like the worst place to throw your cigarette butts, you idiots. Why would you throw them there? You can't pick them up. And here, nobody will even have the idea of that. Yeah. Like a cigarette, if you, if you smoke one, you take it back home with you. And you don't have trash cans over here, which is something that's annoying, but people take their trash back home. <laughs> The people really, really well behave in most uh -huh. most things. Um, so yeah, cleaner. I mean, seriously. And the trains are more on time than in Switzerland, and they have more, and they have they have intercities. So Switzerland, you, and especially I'm talking to you, SBB, Swiss, Swiss Railway. Um, please come over here and study how to do it right. Well, Deutsche Bahn, the German train system should also learn something from there because it's also, uh, yeah, it doesn't work as, as it should. Um, it works better than in many other countries, but it doesn't work as it should work, actually. Um, Pascal, we have um, this, um, well, when we finish uh, um, our, our um, programs, we let the um, speaker, the, the, um, our guest, finish with their own words whatever you want to say whatever you think uh, was left out you have uh, the the honor of closing this uh, very nice talk well thank you very much for the opportunity and anyone listening i sometimes get emails and and questions from people who ask me what can we do we uh, we share your uh, sense of urgency and your sense of despair about what's going on what can we do and um, the one thing i would like to remind everybody is do whatever you can um, we have to form a network of people like Ezequiel is doing and reaching out to me and reaching out to others we have to create networks of people who oppose the bs that is going on and we have to call it bs and we have to work against it in our own ways with what we can do and try to make it inter interlink and interconnect. We shouldn't build big structures because these big structures we've seen time and again, they get captured and then they become part of the problem. Um, create a network of like-minded people, send out newsletters, send out whatever you can think of that's creative that you can do today um, within you know 30 minutes or one hour and even if it just reaches a couple of people it's 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 going to be part of what we need in order to get out of insanity because currently we are going through a period of insanity in Europe and 
um, and North America that is leading us down a very dark path. So don't think you're powerless. Just do what's within your power. Um, I think that's what I would like to convey to everybody. I subscribe your words completely. Um, to all, um, all our viewers, don't forget to subscribe to Pascal's uh, channel in English, which is Neutrality Studies, and its uh, Spanish version, which is Sanevox eh, Español. So we mm, just um, check the description. We will put the links there below. And well, let's wrap it up uh, here. Pascal, it was a pleasure. So see you next time. Thank you. Bye.